Hey everybody, Adam Savage, welcome to my cave, is how I begin almost every single video uh, we film on this channel. Um, and I use cave for a very specific reason. I could certainly say shop. This is my shop where I make stuff every day, but it's more than a shop and cave is my word that delineates that. This is in fact my collection. Um, and it's my collection right now. I consider myself the steward of this collection, but I, I wanna go into what I mean by collection. Uh, gathered in this room are objects that are useful to me and there are objects that are useful to me. The objects that are useful to me are my shops and my tools and my materials and glues and things like that. But the rest of the objects in here, the stuff that inspires me, the stuff that I've made, the stuff that people have given me, the stuff that I've collected, this is a collection and an amalgamation of objects that yield something for me. They teach me, they surprise me, they inspire me. But more than any of those things, they tell me stories and they allow me to tell more stories. So that's how it intersects with me, this collection. But then there's this whole secondary thing, or actually maybe it's primary, which is what this collection does when people visit this space, when I share this space in fundraisers or parties or open houses, and I get to see other people intersect with the stories that the objects in this room tell. And I feel like this is how we progress as humans. We, we see things that inspire us and they tick something in our head and we move towards that direction and we find some deeper part of ourselves, some important part of the way we wanna interact with our culture. So, not to put too high a point on it, but I do think of this space as my collection uh, that I am curating to tell stories. And it is a wonderful happenstance that I have was invited a few years ago to sit on the board for the National Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., because that is the palace of objects and the stories that they tell and the ways in which those stories inspire the visitors. Man, it is such an exciting cycle of goodness. Recently, I was at the National Air and Space Museum and I decided to curate five of my favorite objects in the collection and tell you the stories that resonate with me about those objects. And we started with the Wright Flyer. Behind me, a mannequin of Wilbur Wright is flying the Wright Flyer. This is the original Wright Flyer, the one they first took flight with on the Outer Banks of the Carolinas in Kitty Hawk in 1903. Wilbur is 36 years old when he makes this flight. I get goosebumps every time I'm near this thing in this museum, and it's for a whole host of reasons. But recently, reading the Wright Brothers biography, uh, I came across this great story. Uh, when the Wright Brothers first flew, one of their first letters they wrote was to the US government, and they said, would you like our invention? And the US government didn't actually believe that they had achieved flight. So they called the French government and they sold them a plane. Wilbur sailed across the ocean with this plane in crates, actually a second one. I think it's the military flyer in the other gallery. Uh, and it arrived very damaged and he spent six weeks putting it back together. And while he was putting it back together, all of France was excited about this American and his new plane. So thousands and thousands of people were outside the warehouse he was in looking in while watching him make this plane. And that's the first time I felt this very slight connection to the Wright brothers, because I have some experience of building ridiculous contraptions while a lot of people watch. And it made me feel a connection them, to them. They were engineers and they were scientists, and you might not know that they actually wrote to this institution, the Smithsonian, in 1899 and told them that they were going to fly. They said that they had separated the problem into one of control and power, and that they're going to attack control first, and then they would solve power. And they did it, exactly as they said, only four years later. These guys are way more amazing than I even realized. And the more I learn about them, the more incredible their methodic, beautiful, simple, scientific approach to flight allowed them to succeed where so many before them had failed. The orange beauty behind me is the very plane that Chuck Yeager broke the speed of sound in. It is the Bell X-1, and it was built in upstate New York in 1947. Here's the thing I love about this plane. When the engineers were first designing it, and their charge was to break the speed of sound, which this plane, by the way, did handily. It reached a top speed of 958 miles per hour. But while they were designing it, they weren't sure, one, if a human-made object that a human could be in could even break the speed of sound. And two, they didn't know what shape of object could survive breaking the speed of sound. So first, they weren't even sure that the barrier was something crossable. Second, they didn't know if they could make a vehicle that could sustain it. 
So they did what a lot of engineers do when they're confronted with a problem like this. They thought, what does break the speed of sound? And they made a list. And one of those items was a 50 caliber bullet, which handily goes supersonic. And now you might be seeing what I'm talking about. Yeah, the shape of the Bell X1 is effectively the profile of a 50 caliber bullet. That is pure engineering of my favorite kind, finding a solution in an unexpected place. This is the Friendship 7 Mercury capsule. This is the first American spaceship to carry an American to orbit the Earth, specifically the American John Glenn, who did it in 1962. And when NASA was designing this, they had two really competing engineering goals. They had to make it big enough to fit a human being, which is still small, but you know, bigger than a human. And they had to make it as small as they possibly could and as light as they possibly could, because to get it out of Earth's gravity well takes a tremendous amount of energy. And they were also, at the same time they were making this, also designing the rockets that would carry it out of Earth's gravity well. One of the final design phases of this is they basically had to build a bunch of wooden models that were very close to each other and see which one was the smallest version that John Glenn or someone exactly his size could get in in a spacesuit. I love the idea that with all of this technology and all of this ingenuity, they still had to build wooden models just to mock it up and see if it would work. The Mercury astronauts saying about this ship was that you don't get into it, you put it on. We often talk about spacesuits these days as being anthropomorphic spaceships, but this is absolutely the very first one. This is the ILC Dover A7L spacesuit, the very one that Neil Armstrong wore to the moon and back. And I was talking about the Mercury capsule as an anthropomorphic spaceship. This is the OG anthropomorphic spaceship with a huge and internal cage structure keeping the volume constant while the astronaut moved. This was the highest advancement of spacesuit technology when it was built and famously, ILC Dover is called ILC, that's International Latex Corporation, a subsidiary of Playtex, the makers of bras and undergarments, because when it came time to fit hard parts to soft bodies, it turned out that Playtex was the company that had the institutional knowledge, and they devoted a bunch of their best seamstresses to building the suits for the Apollo program. My friend Nicholas de Monchot wrote literally the book on spacesuits called Spacesuit. I recommend you get it. But he told me that when he was working here at the Smithsonian for a year on that book, that many of the original moonwalkers, when they were in town, would come by the Smithsonian to visit their old suits. That was the level of affection they had built for these spaceships that were built for their bodies and took them safely to the harshest place imaginable and back home to their families. And this is the Space Shuttle Discovery. Okay, let's go back over all five of these objects. The Wright Flyer was built by two people and only one of them ever flew it. This is part of a program that took over 355 astronauts to space. And it's not too much of a stretch to say hundreds of thousands of people built this vehicle. Now I've chosen these five flight vehicles because they inspire me, but also because millions of people worked on all five of these over the last hundred years. And I cast my mind on them. And I think of those millions of people, each of them in different cities, hundreds of cities across the United States, all going to work every morning, applying their particular brand of expertise to the problems they're trying to solve, combining those to solve ever bigger and more complex problems until inventions like this come to fore. And I don't know about you, but when I think upon stuff like that at scales and scopes like that, it makes me amazed at what people can do. And that's actually why I'm here this morning at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, because this is a palace devoted to celebrating that specific example of human ingenuity. That's beautiful. <laughs>